Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. India criticizes China and Pakistan at UN for blocking terrorist blacklisting proposals. Indian security forces bust a hideout in Jammu and Kashmir. And massive protests erupt in Gilgit, Baltistan after Shia cleric's arrest. At a recent United Nations meeting, India convened a diplomatically worded message that subtly criticized China and Pakistan. The main issue, the rejection of proposals to blacklist terrorists with global sanctions. India voiced its concerns about what it sees as obstacles to evidence-based listings. This development has highlighted what some are calling a case of doublespeak on the international stage. India's representative at the UN, Ruchira Kamboj, emphasized the utmost importance of keeping decisions within these committees impartial, free from political influences. We have a report. In a persistent pattern, China has consistently defended its ally, Pakistan, within the United Nations. China has, time and again, created hurdles when it comes to listing known Pakistani terrorists. In June of this year, Beijing blocked a motion jointly put forth by India and the United States to designate Pakistani terrorist Sajid Mir as a global terrorist under the 1267 Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee. This was not an isolated incident. In September of the previous year, China had delayed a similar proposal concerning Mir at the UN. Mir is India's most wanted terrorist and the main handler of the 2611 Mumbai terror attacks that shook the entire world. India, however, has consistently responded to Beijing's actions. Recently, in a veiled attack at China and Pakistan, India's permanent representative to the UN, Ruchira Kamboj, slammed China and Pakistan for their attempts to obstruct evidence-based proposals aimed at blacklisting globally sanctioned terrorists within the United Nations Security Council. India's UN ambassador emphasized the critical importance of transparency and objectivity in the working procedures of sanctions committee calling for decisions not to be influenced by political considerations. For genuine, evidence-based listing proposals for globally sanctioned terrorists to be blocked without giving any due justification is uncalled for and smacks of doublespeak when it comes to the Council's commitment in tackling the challenge of terrorism. China has often defended its actions by citing technical objections based on procedural matters. Yet, it is an open secret that China has a clear pattern of protecting Pakistan internationally. For instance, in June of the previous year, India and the United States jointly proposed the listing of Abdul Rahman Maki, a close associate and brother-in-law of Lashkar-e Taiba Stara outfit founder Hafi Say on the UN Security Council's list of global terrorists. Both nations had already designated Maki as a terrorist under their respective domestic laws and the US had offered $2 million reward for his capture. Nevertheless, China blocked India's move at the UN Security Council by imposing a technical hold on the proposal, shielding Maki from global terrorist designation. China, to protect their favourite colony, Pakistan, has always been kept doing this. It did the same thing with jaish e mohammed chief Masood Azhar. New Delhi proposed sanctioning Masood Azhar in the year 2009, but it finally happened almost 10 years later in 2019. And during this time, Beijing kept blocking India's proposal. When it comes to uh, dealing with terrorism, especially at multilateral fora, it must be remembered that China, for China, this is business as usual. Remember, what they do is a technical hold. What is a technical hold? 
when they say we are putting a technical hold, they are not opposing the motion. What they are saying is we need time for consultations, more information, and this can go on till six months till the technical hold is raised. So what China does is the following. By putting on a technical hold, which is technically not opposing the resolution, they are saying we want information and consultations. It allows Pakistan to do certain things which takes away the momentum from such resolutions. Now, why does it do it? It's a quid pro quo. China has been uh, Pakistan's ally. Uh, it has aided Pakistan in its nuclear program. It has aided... Pakistan is a country which from time to time has delivered what few nations would do in terms of dirty tactics for other nations. Previously, they did this for the United States. Now, they are doing it for China. So, given such a country which is able to do your dirty job for you, it is uh, understandable why China would uh, stand up for Pakistan. But of course, China is clever. What it does is to ensure that it does so in a manner so that China is not seen to be supporting terrorism because China is also a victim of terrorism in the Xinjiang region. But it does so in a manner that Pakistan is able to get away with it, but no mud sticks to China. China has maintained its diplomatic backing for Pakistan at the United Nations. In return, Pakistan has given up its power and territory to demonstrate its loyalty to Beijing. However, this unwavering allegiance to China, driven by promises of economic prosperity and friendship, is causing Pakistan to miss opportunities for true independence. As a result, Pakistan risks neglecting the essential needs of its own citizens. In contrast, India is determined to continue its path of progress and will work towards holding Pakistan and China accountable on the global stage. Let's shift our focus to Pakistan's illegally occupied territory of Gilgit Baltistan, where there are massive protests underway over the arrest of a Shia cleric. The cleric Aga Bakir al Husseini was arrested on blasphemy charges after making comments at a religious gathering. The protests have been going on for several days now and they have only grown in size. Thousands of protesters took to the streets in Skardu, the capital of Gilgit Baltistan. They have blocked roads, burned tires and chanted slogans, demanding the release of the cleric. The protests are a sign of the growing discontent in Gilgit Baltistan. The region has long been neglected by the Pakistani government and the people are demanding more autonomy. The arrest of the cleric has only served to further anger the people. A report. On August 31st, waves of dissent swept through Skardu, a town in Pakistan-occupied Gilgit, Baltistan. Massive protests erupted over the arrest of Shia cleric ulema Aga Bakir al Husseini, apprehended under Pakistan's strength and blasphemy laws. Thousands of followers of Husseini took to the streets and chanted slogans against the Pakistani army and politicians and even threatened to merge with India. The allegations against Husseini stem from purported provocative remarks he made during an ulema council meeting in Skardu. This meeting was convened to discuss Pakistan's efforts to tighten its blasphemy laws, a move seemingly aimed at the Shia community. However, Husseini and those present at his speech said that nothing was said that would displease any community. Pakistan's illegally occupied territory of Gilgit Baltistan is a Shia majority region. Though Shias make up a sizable portion of the population in Gilgit Baltistan, Pakistan is a nation with a Sunni majority. Over the years, Pakistani's successive governments, beginning with the era of Ziaul Haq, have made efforts to alter the demographic composition by resettling Sunni community there. 
while both Shia and Sunni Muslims share the core principles of Islam. They differ in their reverence for certain historical Islamic figures. This religious distinction has contributed to a sense of inequality among the Shia community in Pakistan, leading to discrimination in critical aspects of their lives, including religious places, educational institutions, and job opportunities. Pakistan ke andar mehsoos kiya gaya ki ek maslak ko diwar se lagaya ja raha hai, ek maslak ke aqide ki azadi ko salb kiya ja raha hai. Halanke mushtarakat par jo hai wo kanun saazi honi chahiye. Aur mushtarakat par kanun saazi nahi ki gayi, balki ummat e Muslima ke andar paaye jaane wale dunyadi ekhtilafat ki aaj ke ekhtilafat hain. Aur ye ekhtilafat 1400 saalon se chale aa rahe hain. تو کیا سبب ہے کہ آج جو ہے وہ ان اقتلافات کو مزید دوبارہ جا رہا ہے اور ایک عقیدے کو دوسرے پر مسلط کرنے کی کوشش کی جاری ہے اس کی قطعاً پاکستان کی آئین نہ اجازت دیتی ہے نہ ہمارا معاشرہ اس بات کی اجازت دیتا ہے نہ بین اللہ قوامی قوانی اس بات کی اجازت دیتا ہے ان جانوری 2023 پاکستان فردر سٹرنگتن اٹس آلریڈی ہارش بلاس فیمی لوز تو پنش اینی ون کنوکٹیڈ او انسلٹنگ پیپل connected to Prophet Muhammad. This amendment significantly increased the minimum penalty for such offenses from 3 to 10 years in prison, coupled with a fine of 1 million Pakistani rupees. Due to Pakistan's history of abusing these laws, the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan expressed deep concerns about these legislative changes, fearing they might disproportionately affect minority groups and exacerbate abuse. This could result in unjustified accusations, mistreatment and oppression, with minority communities such as Ahmadis, Christians and Shia Muslims bearing the brunt of these injustices. An alarming illustration of this oppression is the attacks on churches in Faisalabad, Pakistan, with the government appearing to neglect such vigilante assaults. With the rise in sectarian violence in Pakistan, many countries, including the United States, UK and Canada, have advised their citizens to avoid traveling to Gilgit, Baltistan. Pakistan is already facing such restrictions due to terrorism and other conflicts causing insecurity to the foreign visitors. Millions of Afghans are at risk of starvation as the United Nations is forced to cut food rations due to lack of funding. The UN World Food Programme has warned that nearly half the country's population are facing potentially life-threatening levels of food insecurity and malnutrition this year. The World Food Programme has been providing food assistance to millions of Afghans since the Taliban took control of the country in August 2021. However, the agency has been struggling to raise the necessary funds to continue its operations. We have a report. Two years have passed since the Taliban group seized power in Afghanistan and the nation finds itself tittering on the brink of collapse. Hundreds of thousands are facing hunger while millions grapple with joblessness and crushing poverty. The humanitarian and economic catastrophe already inflicting immeasurable suffering on countless individuals shows no signs of relenting and, in fact, is anticipated to worsen. In a recent development, the United Nations World Food Programme announced that it would be forced to cut food aid to an additional 2 million people in Afghanistan. This grim decision is a direct consequence of inadequate funding. The World Food Program has received merely a quarter of the essential financial support required to sustain its operations in Afghanistan this year. The cuts will have a devastating impact on the people of Afghanistan who are already facing a severe hunger crisis. <laughs> The 
Voy a poner un saludo al carroz. Hablo de los falsos de corrigir la hora. This reduction in food assistance comes at a time when concerns over diminishing aid for Afghanistan are mounting. The World Food Programme estimates that 15 million people in Afghanistan are facing acute food insecurity and the cuts could push millions more into hunger. 15 million people who actually need food assistance. Um, but we've had to cut from March, 13 million people was kind of our, our winter planning period. Um, and then in May, we had to reduce 8 million people from assistance. And this month, we're having to reduce another 2 million. That means 10 million people that we had served previously and who need assistance are going to bed hungry without any food assistance that WFP is able to provide. Afghanistan, emerging from decades of conflict, now operates under the internationally isolated rule of the Taliban, who assumed control following the withdrawal of US-backed forces in 2021. An astonishing three-quarters of the population now depends on humanitarian aid for survival. The development assistance that previously sustained the government's finances has been severed, while sanctions against the Taliban and frozen central bank assets abroad have exacerbated the crisis. Additionally, restrictions on women imposed by the Taliban, preventing many from working, continue to hinder the country's path towards formal recognition and recovery. Let's now move to India's Jammu and Kashmir, where the Pakistan-backed terrorists are trying to disrupt peace and create havoc in the Union territory. Although there has been a sharp decline in the infiltration from across the border, due to high security, some terrorists are still hiding in Jammu and Kashmir. Security forces recently busted a terrorist hideout in Riyasi. We have a report. Rattled by a peaceful and progressive environment in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan is trying every trick in the book to unleash violence and chaos in the region. On September 4, a fierce encounter erupted between security forces and terrorists in the Kalaban forest area of Riyasi district. During this confrontation, one terrorist was neutralized. This clash was triggered when a combined team of police and paramilitary forces received intelligence about the presence of terrorists in the vicinity. As security forces swiftly cordoned off the area, the concealed terrorists opened fire, prompting an immediate and resolute response from security forces. This encounter in Riyasi district marks the latest development in a series of such confrontations between security forces and terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir. Indian security forces have already successfully countered Pakistan in Kashmir Valley very well. And this we have seen that the number of incidents, there are incidents that were there before 2019 and after 2019. There has been a steep fall in all of them. Apart from that, the stone pelting, apart from that the hartals, apart from that the, uh, the cries and the uh, slogans of uh, Pakistan uh, Kashmir Banega, Pakistan and things like that. And of course, the crowning glory is that Lal Chok, which was considered to be one of the hottest hubs of this terrorism and where the Indian national flag was never allowed to be raised all these years, was now resounding with Bharat Mata Ki Jai and Hindustan Jindabad and the national flag of India was waved by so many people over there. A large number of Pakistan-backed terrorists are hiding in Jammu and Kashmir. They are waiting for an opportunity to carry out a terror attack and disrupt peace in the region. On September 3, the Indian Army also demolished an IED in the same region. A major incident has been averted due to prompt actions by security forces. The persistent presence of heavily armed terrorists in the hinterland underscores ongoing efforts by hostile elements to destabilize the region. Pakistan appears to be altering its tactics, dispatching highly trained and well-equipped terrorists 
for guerrilla-style attacks on security convoys, camps, and patrols instead of deploying them in the Kashmir Valley to target civilians and minorities. Jammu and Kashmir police suspect that Rajauri, Punch, and Riyasi districts are the prime targets of Pakistan and its affiliated terror groups. This aligns with Islamabad's agenda to revive terrorism in the region. In January 2023, the peaceful village of Dangri in Rajori district fell victim to a terrorist attack, resulting in the tragic loss of seven innocent lives. Subsequently, in April and May of the same year, separate terrorist incidents claimed the lives of five brave soldiers and five civilians, including two young children. ISI has now come up with a plan to reignite terrorism in Jammu province in the areas of Riyasi and Punch districts. Because these two districts are adjoining uh, to the LOC, adjoining Pakistan. The terrain over here is uh, very conducive for infiltration because it consists of a lot of shrubs, consists of uh, ravines, consists and has many caves, natural hideouts for the terrorists to uh, sneak in and stay there. Despite facing international criticism on various global platforms, Pakistan persists in utilizing terrorism as a core component of its state policy. In a world where nations strive for peace, harmony and technological advancement, Pakistan's unwavering commitment to a state-sponsored terrorism continues to sow violence and cultivate a growing sense of distrust on a global scale. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.